Which brings me to piece of evidence number seven. This has not to do with Benedict, but to do with the canonically illegal behavior of the St. Gallen Mafia Cardinals in conspiring to vote in their man from Buenos Aires in 2013 invalidates the conclave. Okay, that's the claim. That's not at all true or substantiated by what John Paul II actually says, but that's the claim. These left-wing modernist ideologues with red hats schmoozed, politicked, and covertly strategized to make sure that Cardinal Bergoglio would be elected pope. You know what? Let's just go ahead and accept that. That's true. I think we could offer some pushback on it, but let's just go ahead. I'm, I'm aware of what Daniels and the others said. Let's just go ahead and accept it for the moment, for argument's sake. They didn't hide what they did. In, in a moment, I'm going to mention where they brag about it. There's just one little problem. Pope St. John Paul II anticipated schemers like this and conspirators. And he wrote an apostolic constitution in 1996 titled University Dominici Gregis. Short of a dogmatic definition, an apostolic constitution is the highest level of a legislative document that. Oh, let, let me pause there and go down a rabbit trail. I'm sorry. He stepped in it, so I got to go down it. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, apostolic constitutions are pretty high magisterially when it comes to papal magisterium. Sure. You know what else is a uh, apostolic constitution? The promulgation of the new liturgy. Just throwing that one out there. The Pope can issue. Mm -hmm. University Dominici Gregis, you can see the link below and read it yourself. It, it laid down very specific rules that would govern future papal conclaves. Mm -hmm. It covers the procedures, the shape of the voting ballots. The, uh, the various roles of assistance. Some of which has been modified, but the parts that he's going to talk about are, are substantially intact, to my knowledge. Including provided for sick and infirm cardinals who would be voting, but who wouldn't be in the Sistine Chapel on the day of the, uh, the vote. The document forbids any audio or visual recording devices, and every imaginable detail of a papal conclave is covered by this authoritative set of prescriptions and proscriptions, do's and don'ts. And it explicitly condemns the very behavior that the St. Gallen Mafia had bragged about in at least three different public forums. What are they? Number one, Uncle Ted McCarrick, the molester, gave a talk at Villanova University in 2013. You can watch for yourself in the link where he talks about schmoozing, talking someone up. Number two, the flattering biography of Godfrey Cardinal Daniels, who coined the phrase St. Gallen Mafia. And number three, the even more flattering biography by a loyal lieutenant, Austin Ivory, of Pope Francis, called The Great Reformer, which absurdly came out only a year or so after Francis moved to Rome. Now, these, uh, these Francis cheerleaders describe in, in some detail behavior that John Paul II specifically taught was punishable by latte sententiae, automatic excommunication. That part's true. And this applied both to the conspirators and to the one who assents to the conspiracy to manipulate the conclave. The latter part there is debatable, but let's go ahead and accept it. And get the result they want mm -hmm. in politicking. Mm -hmm. Let me just quote two sections. But then the his conclusion is that it's an, an invalid conclave because these cardinals were late sententia excommunicated. Right. So let, let's let's go through his um, his uh, his evidence for this of University Dominici Greg. Mm -hmm. Number 79, quote, confirming the, the prescriptions of my predecessors. I, this is John Paul II, likewise forbid anyone, even if he's a cardinal during the pope's lifetime and without having consulted him to make plans concerning the election of his successor. Yeah, he, he forbids it. Sure. Or to promise votes. Promise votes. No, notice that. Or to make decisions in this regard in private gatherings. Unquote. Number eight. So he, he forbids. Sure. 81. Quote, the cardinal electors shall further abstain from any form of pact, agreement, promise, or any other commitment of any. Notice promise there. Any kind. Which notice commitment of any kind. Which could oblige them to give or deny. Notice oblige. Deny their vote to a person or persons. He goes on, if this were in fact done, even under oath, notice under oath, 
I decree that such a commitment shall be null and void. Commitment is null and void. Did you hear that? And that no one shall be bound to observe it. No one's bound to observe it. What he's saying is that if you come into, you, you, you make some kind of pact and even an oath prior to the conclave that you're going to elect somebody, are you bound to that oath? No. He dispenses you from you that oath, from that oath. He dispenses you from it. That's what he's saying. He's saying it's null and void. The commitment. He didn't say it's null and void the person who's elected. That's not what he, said, what he says. He's saying a pact, agreement, promise, commitment, an oath. That is what is null and void. Not the person elected. I want you to notice that. And I hereby impose the penalty of excommunication, latte sententiae, upon those who violate this prohibition. So he's saying if you go in, try to, you know, have this commitment or even an oath to elect a particular person and you, and you conspire to do this prior to a conclave, you're automatically excommunicated. That's true. That is true. And you might even argue that that applies to the people who elected Pope Francis or even Pope Francis himself. Does that invalidate the conclave? That's the question. I know he's going to go over paragraph 76 here in a moment. And we're going to address that. But let's first just address paragraph 81, which is what he's talking about right now. Is that somehow an impediment to the conclave and the validity of his election? that they are excommunicated, the person who conspired and the person who is elected. I want to give you Ed Peters, canonist Ed Peters, way more authoritative than I am. I'm not an expert on canon law, so I could just offer my opinion or I could tell you what he says. And he's an expert in canon law, and I think he's one of the best. He says this, the prohibition against late sententia, and he's talking in this context, on this document, this is his commentary on this document. Uh, I think it's in his article, Excommunicated Cardinals and Conclaves. The prohibition against late sententiae excommunicates, vo excommunicates, excommunicates. Voting goes only to the lyceity, not the validity of the ballot cast. If you were automatically excommunicated because you conspired to have Pope Francis elected, or you're Pope Francis, right? You're somehow part of this conspiracy. You're automatically excommunicated. Does that go against the validity of the election? No. No, it does not. It goes against the lyceity of it, but not the validity. Ed Peters, take it up with him. And he, of course, substantiates that base on uh, Canon 1405 uh, paragraphs, I believe, uh, parts one and two. <clears throat> but again, take it up with him. Let's continue. The late Pope goes on to say, it's not my intention, however, to forbid during the period which the Holy See is vacant, the exchange of views concerning the election. Section 82, quote, I likewise forbid the Cardinals before the election forbid to enter into any stipulations committing themselves of common accord to a certain course of action should one of them be elevated to the pontificate. Forbid doesn't mean that it's invalid. Mm -hmm. These promises too, should any in fact be made. The promises, mm -hmm. even under oath, mm -hmm. I also declare null. Right, the promises are null and void, not the conclave. Mm -hmm. And void. Yep. And finally, most importantly, it's section 76. Here we go. This is the strongest argument that he has. I'm going to show why I think it can be strongly put to rest. But here's, here's the heart of the matter. Aside from the Munus Mysterium confusion, um, here it is. Paragraph 76. Quote, should the election take place in a way other than that prescribed in this present constitution, or should the conditions laid down here not be observed? The election is for this reason. Null and void. You hear it? Now the election is null and void if the prescriptions laid out here aren't observed. And he had just read to us at 81 where if they're conspiring 
their commitment's null and void and their late sentencia. So does that now mean, well, they didn't follow the rules of this, so therefore the conclave is null and void? You, you see the, the, the argument? It's his strongest argument. Here's why it doesn't work. You just quoted paragraph 76. Let, let's read it again. Paragraph 76. Should the election taken a place in a way other than that prescribed in the present constitution, or should the conditions laid down here not be observed? What is he talking about? Prescriptions in the constitution. Conditions. He's talking about what he has spoken up until paragraph 76 that involves the ballots. The way in which the conclave is done, the ballots are done. That's what he's talking about, the prescriptions and conditions for that. And if that's not followed, it's null and void. It's only later on in paragraph 81 that he talks about an automatic excommunication for people who are conspiring. It's not in, this is not in that context. Paragraph 81 with the cardinals being excommunicated is after this. So what he's talking about prescriptions and conditions in this has to be the stuff that precedes it, which again has to do with the ballot and how he's elected. Right. Not necessarily if somebody is conspiring. He addresses that later on. But you'll notice there in paragraph 81, when he's talking about cardinals who are conspiring, he doesn't say the election is null and void. He says they're automatically excommunicated. And Dr. Peters well notes that that would then go against the lyceity of the election, not the validity. What pertains to the validity is everything described up until paragraph 76, not paragraph 81. Paragraph 81 is after paragraph 76. And again, the conditions, the stuff that he's talking about is not what's found in paragraph 81. The conditions pertains to voting procedures, ballots, stuff like that. But even if you want to say, but it says prescribed in this present constitution. Yes, he's talking about voting rules being prescribed in this present constitution. Paragraph 81 and, and Cardinals conspiring is it voting rules. Um, but, you know, e even if that were the case, you have to accept all of canon laws, Dr. Peters notes. And all of canon law is going to say that it's still, however, a valid conclave even if you have cardinals conspiring. But what he does is he quotes to you paragraph 81 and shows that cardinals are conspiring. And then he quotes to you paragraph 76 and saying, look, if this stuff isn't observed, then it's the election is null and void. But he ripped it right out of context. And he switched the order. The order is first the prescriptions and the conditions Described so far up until paragraph 76, if those aren't met, the election is null and void, which it's up to the church to determine that anyway, not some private individual on YouTube, right? It's up to the church to determine the validity of an election. But be that as it may, it's talking about the stuff leading up to paragraph 76. He switched it, though, and mentions paragraph 81 first and then 76. And again, paragraph 81 pertains to the lyceity of the election, not the validity. You're going to have to show why Ed Peters is wrong on that. And you're going to have to show why paragraph 76 and what it's saying about prescriptions and conditions in the present constitution applies to what's said in paragraph 81, because those aren't necessarily prescriptions and conditions for the voting procedures and the ballots and the election of the Pope, the actual procedures. Paragraph 81 is dealing with things prior to the procedures of the election of the Pope. That's why I think that his this is his strongest argument, and yet I think it can be strongly refuted because of this. Um, and I, I don't seem to be alone. It seems that Ed Peters in his um in his article, Francis was never um Francis was never Pope called me unpersuaded article. Um, he seems to interpret paragraph 76 in the same way that this has to do with the context of the voting ballots and, and stuff like that. It doesn't have anything to do with um, 
Leite Sententia excommunications of cardinals because even those, they may not licitly vote, but they do validly vote. And he pulls that from other parts of canon law as well. And he notes that particular law, like this document by John Paul II, has to be interpreted in light of the rest of the law. You can't take particular law and interpret it apart from canon law, the rest of canon law. Um, and the rest of canon law, as he shows, indicates that cardinals who are late sententia can still validly elect the pope. So I think that puts his argument to rest. And I think that was his strongest argument. But even so, if somehow paragraph 76 applies to 81, that's not up to an individual layman to determine, right? That, that's going to be up to the, the bishops, the cardinals, the authorities to, de, to weigh in and judge and determine, not random individuals like myself or Patrick Coffin on, on YouTube. Not that he's random. He's well known. You know what I mean, though. Not regular individual laity, private individual judgments. I don't, I don't think that's sufficient. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. See you next time. God bless.